Please welcome to the stage the star of The Exorcist, Miss Linda Blair. commercials in New York City. I'm from Connecticut. Oh, <laughs> well, I like it. I wanted to be a veterinarian. How many people know that? Wow. You could have lied. So I had wanted to be, since I was very young, a veterinarian. And my mother had said to me, if you work the acting was, was all new. So there was a, 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 a magazine called Time, Life, Look magazine back then, and they did an article about kids modeling doing commercials. So she thought, well, here's an avenue that I could work, save my money, and pursue whatever uh, you know, degree, college, whatever I wanted to do. My mother was very, very independent. And um, so that's what we did. We saved my money. and. And when I was about 12, way back then, if you did uh, bathing suits, you did them in the winter for Sears, Roebuck, JCPenney, all of these magazines. And back then, so if they put you in a pose, <laughs> you literally had to hold that for 15 minutes. <laughs> and remember the hoods? Have you ever seen that, the cameras with the capes over there? Yeah. Okay, that, that was real, and they would take a picture. It was hard. So in the summer, you're doing winter coats. You're hot, you're stuffing you with cellophane. You're hot. In the winter, you're cold. It wasn't glamorous. It wasn't like, oh, I want to go to Hollywood and do this. You know, I, There was no connection between movie making, theater. I was, she did not force me to train uh, for theater, stage, so. When I was about 12, I, I knew I'd had enough. And I said to her, I did over 75 commercials. And child actors, you do what you're told to do, which is going to show in a minute. So um, if they say, you know, like you're selling a dog, a dog commercial or something, or Welch's grape jelly, carefree sugarless gum, Golden's mustard, downy fabric softener, just a few. And um, so you do what you're told to do, and as long as you do, you'll be rehired. So I just sort of had enough. I wanted to get ready to go to Cornell, which is a big veterinarian school in, in, on the East Coast. So I told her, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> and her reaction was, okay, you know, I, I understand. But you have to finish off some jobs. So. Maybe I had a couple gigs with you know, J.C. Petty, the, you know, the, the catalog. You've had your fittings. You have to do and finish the work. And so I, um, we had maybe a week or two. And as you would leave New York City, she would stop at the old-fashioned payphone, like the phone that you hear in the movie that actually got all of us. I was up on the bal balcony, and even even the, and I know the telephone when it goes off. <laughs> so anyway, she calls the agent and said, okay, we're leaving the city. Is there anything else? And they said, actually, you have an interview for a movie. Well, I've done two small movies with not going anywhere. I wanted to be in Flipper, Lassie. Um, <laughs> well, this is true. So I was known as the Cinderella girl. I, I was the Cinderella girl. And I wanted to do be a flipper, lassie, any gentle bed, I didn't care. But my dad was like, no. So 
I'd done some stuff, but never went anywhere. There was no other thoughts in my head. And so we had to go in for an interview for this movie. Well, the movie obviously is this. Did what I was told to do and read a paragraph of filthy language. <laughs> they said, oh. And they're like, can you do it again You know, with a little more anger, power, whatever. So uh, they saw that I would do what they told me to do. I look like a little, uh, you know, the little Cinderella, little clean cut American girl. So eventually we meet Billy Friedkin. He brings in my mother. We talk about the book. Now I know tonight you are going to meet Billy originally. I don't know. I'm hoping we all are that he's doing well. He is a genius. <laughs> Billy is a genius. And, and psychologically, as I talk about The Exorcist, it is a movie, it's, about, it's a theological, psychological thriller. So it's going to hit you in everything that you might want to fear, that you didn't realize. Um, it's about good and evil. Everything that we are dealing with on the planet right now cannot be more prevalent. The movie starts in Iraq. It's war. It's religion. We have not changed. So the movie is much more intelligent if you listen to it. What I got from it by watching it tonight is the extraordinary, as I've always talked about the cinematography, that's Owen Roisman. Everything we do in this movie was like a magic act. You can't see all of the equipment. There's no CGI. The only thing, and, and this particular one is the one all the fans wanted to see, like, the, um, in the spider walk where it comes down, so Billy gave you some blood. <laughs> he's, he's funny. Billy's funny. Um, so there's a little CGI in that one, but the original, no. It is absolutely a magic that Dick Smith, who did the makeup, he's the grandfather <laughs> of all makeup. So at 13 years old, 12 years old, he was 13, because I had a birthday, 13, 14. And so he has to make all of these makeup pieces. So he starts with the mask, and Billy's like, no, no, I have to see it's her. And he brought me in, my mother and everything, and explained, I have to know it's her. No mask. And that's why you see, you, I mean, you can't really see, some of you may know if you've studied makeup or anything, but the prosthetics. So I am 13 years old, they pour all of this stuff on your head, they make a mold. And from the mold of your, the cast of your face, that's how they designed all the prosthetic pieces. Sorry about that. All the prosthetic pieces that are on my face. And then he's a master painter. But we did test after test. They could purple, green, blue, red. How does it photograph? And that goes back to the history of film, how color photographs, and so on and so forth. So you have the, the, the master, Dick Smith, and, and Billy Friedkin is pushing them. All of the vomit scenes, I can't do that on cue, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> or thank God. <laughs> and so there's a lot of equipment that I'm wearing. It's uncomfortable. It takes hours to put on. I'm in school, and there's, there's only so many hours you can work kids. So this was very strict. It's a closed set in New York, and um, no one was allowed in. They brought in Marcel Bocatier, and he's the one that designed a lot of the equipment that I am, that I'm flying in, that I'm all the sitting up and down. How many people know about what happened to me with my back during that scene? Some of you. So in the beginning, when Reagan is flail, flail, flailing around, up and down, up and down, the equipment came loose. So it was smashing my back. So when I'm yelling, make it stop, it hurts, it burns, that was the dialogue, but it truly was what was happening. And I'm screaming, and they think I'm the best actress in history. <laughs> so with that said, I did sustain injuries in that way, which as I've gotten older, there's a lot of things why some of you have seen I'm a vegan, some of you have seen different things and what I've done with my life. I have made myself get through and to challenge myself to be 
the best that I can be to get the most out of life, to be good to others, work really hard. And all of that pays off. That's how I was raised. I was not raised Catholic. Billy Friedkin, when he was interviewing me, he wanted to see how mentally sound I was. And I get it and respect that. Because if you had been raised Catholic, I don't think anybody could have withstood what the film was about. I was raised Protestant. We didn't talk about the devil. We didn't talk about punishment. We talked about goodness, being good to others, and, and, and trying to be the best we can be, forgiveness, love. So for me, the, 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 the demon was like Frankenstein. And for me, I just didn't understand why the men wanted to put all that ugly makeup on me and make me say ugly things. <laughs> that was hard for me as a child. And so some of the dialogue that's in the movie was not in the book or the screenplay. That's all Billy Friedkin. Not going to repeat it. You heard it. Not going to hurt your ears again. So he would hand me this dialogue at night on a piece of paper. And he would say, here is tomorrow's dialogue. And I would look at it and say, I, I, I can't say that. I knew it was wrong. And he said, yes, yes, you can. And I would say, no, I can't. And this went back and forth. This is true. Very private moments. So long story short, you know who won? <laughs> um, Billy is an incredible director. He's an incredible visionary. And with that comes tough and commitment. And what I realized as an adult, what Billy gave me was I have an eye for perfection. I don't live that way. You can't, you can't. Materialism, it just doesn't work anymore. It's, it's, the, it's the times have changed. So there's certain things that I just know. Try harder, work harder. Look for, if you can fix a mistake, fix it. You will not find one mistake in that movie. I have, I have seen it a few times. Hmm. And I'm sure many of you have. May I say and ask, was that magnificent on the first <laughs> watch it very often. And it's one thing on TV, and literally, I was over there, I was in the back, it's gorgeous. And that is, is um, that was what they, they, they wanted to be the best they could, could be. Owen Roisman, the cinematographer, I mean, believe me, Billy made everybody be the best they could be. Think outside the box, do more. If you think you're there, you're not. Do it again, find it, make it better. And so there's a lot of things that went on in the movie you've heard rumors about. Some is true, some is not. Some are things that actors commit with the director, with their co-actors, to do certain things that might bring a certain emotion, um, make you more on edge. So in the process, I'm playing the character that I'm playing. I cannot react. I cannot move. Do you notice how cold it was? That's real breath. That's not CGI. It was 17 below. They had big fans in there overnight that would make like a meat walker. And in the morning, it would be 17 below. They would, they would be lighting it. It would come up to zero. Pretty much that's what we were working at, was around zero. If you notice, I didn't have a lot on. That way, it was cold. And so that's why you see Max von Steiner, you see his breath, and Jason Miller, and, and, and Ellen Burstyn. And, but Billy wanted you to feel. He wanted you to, to hear 
that that's why the phone rang or the noises or a lot of the things. If he could have had shaking seats, he, he did, he wanted that, <laughs> but it wasn't possible back then. So he hit you with everything that he could, with sound, not just the devil, with other noises. So if I introduce the movie, I say to people, I want you to listen to the dialogue, the sound, I want you to watch every single time that they take you to that room. You don't want to go, but you'll want to go. <laughs> because you as an audience got to see what's on the other side of the door. Me. <laughs> so, the, the scenes where um, you, when Ella Burstyn and Kitty Winning are running up the stairs, and the camera is following or in front. Owen Royston made a chair, and that was on rigging like Peter Pan. So he was being pulled backwards, and it was like that was the first of like a steady cam that came later on in life. So the movie, working with, it was a lot of rehearsal. So I worked with Ellen Burstyn, I worked with Max Mancito, Jason Miller. Each one. Obviously, super extraordinary. What you see is some of the greatest acting, writing, directing, cinematographer, special effects, makeup. You are seeing everything, the best of the best. The movie has withstood because of it. And for that, I thank you so much. Let's go back to Linda's love for him. <laughs> so, how many here, when you were young, had a dream that maybe you haven't been able to completely fulfill, or maybe you have? So, when I'm in my 20s, so I, at that point I'd done Air Force 75, and my mother and I sat on the stairs of the uh, of the honey wagon. I didn't have my own trailer yet. And there goes um, uh, Charlton Heston, mom and I like this. It's, it's Moses. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm as real as you guys are. It was quite something. Karen Black, George Kennedy, and so on and so forth. And then the next movie was uh, Born Innocent, the first television movie. <laughs> I know some of you were probably not old enough, but it was the first television movie, and like The Exorcist, it kind of rocked the world. And so now I became this very controversial teenager. I wasn't writing this. I was just perform you know, doing what I was told to do. Remember that statement? <laughs> and so then I did Sarah T, Portrait of a Teenage Alcoholic. <laughs> Mark Hamill was my boyfriend, not bad. <laughs> And so on and so forth. I worked with Exorcist II with Richard Burton. And what I would say to you is that we all, many of us, grew up with the great Richard Burton and a lot of these stars that were just amazing. To work with him was an honor. Was he completely there all the time? No, he wasn't. <laughs> but when he did focus, let me tell you the power of incredible acting. It's a high, you work hard, you get into a mental, a place that is so extraordinary. So if you notice like, okay, you see how I, I can move my head? No, no, no. So there's lights. On The Exorcist, I had the contacts. So every single move that I made with, with my head is choreographed. And that along with the dialogue and everything else. These are just some of the things that are so specific in understanding filmmaking. You can go out and make a film, but is it any good? Do you know what you're really doing? Do you understand? This movie is not shot in the dark. Nobody is, you know, jumping out at you. It is psychologically, it's 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 light, and yet we are so I wanted to say I share with you the, the appreciation. And again, I thank you for coming out for that.
But in my 20s, having worked all those years, being the most controversial teenager for not anything I set out to do, follow your dream. My dream was to help animals. My dream was to make the planet better. I grew up with the Doris Day, Lucille Ball, a lot of different things. And we all have people, mentors, people that inspire. I want to be like them. So in my 20s, I probably had my midlife crisis because in the film business, you grow up very, very fast. And what about me? What, are, what am I doing? So I met a guy named Chris DeRose from Last Chance for Animals, police officer dedicating his life to animal welfare. When you delve deep into what we do, it is the devil. When you delve deep into what mankind can do, it's not good. And why I say this is because the film is about good and evil. Evil is on the planet right now. We need to work harder to get rid of it. Is there a possibility? Sure. But we have to work hard. So I live in a very difficult place that I understand is as challenging as the movie. It's a look at mankind and, and the reality of what people can, can do. So years ago, I learned to say, how you treat an animal will be how you're going to treat a fellow human. So as time goes on, homeless animals, huh, we have the largest population of homeless people in America. It's what happens to animals, it's gonna happen to people. I've never been wrong. And what can we do? We can do better. So where does that lead? I rescue animals that are thrown away by one, two, what is somebody else's throwaway is somebody else's treasure. One of the dogs that I've rescued, and I've done over 2,500, that's just what I do personally. I am not a shelter, but I know and I can tell my dog back to the beginning. I love cats, by the way, they raise me. I have people say cats, and I'm like, no, 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 I love cats. The dogs came to me in my time of losing my, my personal dog, my mother, and my other dog, I was devastated. And I'd done, been doing animal welfare, so I started rescuing, walking our shelters. Why is that dog dying? It has a cold. What? It has a cold, you're gonna kill it? Why is that dog dying? It has diarrhea. And you're gonna kill it? What about medicine? So that's what I do. And all up and down the state, around the country, I do what I can. So I had a little cross-eyed pistol. Daddy. Daddy's boy's cross-eyed. And I got her home. Nice lady. Didn't know she had a nervous breakdown. A neighbor called. And the neighbor said, she's probably not going to come back. She's in the hospital. What? So I'm like, Sally, we're Sally. She goes, that's why I'm calling. And there's a Doberman. A Doberman? It, 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 not my dog. I don't, I don't know whose it is. Long story short, I got the two. I wasn't going to leave them there. So they came, and he was terrified. People don't realize how sensitive animals are. They actually are a gift, I believe, to humans. They are here to serve, to help. I don't care if it's empty nesters, I don't care if it's handicapped, I don't care if it's emotional, I don't care if it's heart, if it's diabetes, whatever it is, they are gifted in a way that is to be by our side, not left in a backyard, not chained up, and not experimented on. Those days must end, and it's gonna take us forever to change it. So I get this dog home, and he's dragging, Sally's still around by her neck, and like a caveman. And I think, okay, I'm not sure that's good. So I call a very dear friend of mine named Marwick Kane. I said, Marwick, you've got, you've got Dobermans. Can you come and tell me? I don't know anything about them. So where you all might be afraid of a pit bull years ago, that's the breed I'm known for stopping the breed ban and fighting for them because I saw me. And then the prejudice 
and incorrect information about them was what I recognized that had happened to me when I was very young. So that's why I fight for them. Didn't know anything about Dobermans. Had learned about Rottweilers. I was basing my fears. So Marway comes up. He explains the breed, how they play, what they do. And he says, do you want me to take them? Cut to years later. He's now a therapy, therapy, I always get it. Therapy service dog? Therapy dog. Therapy. So, have anybody been to the airports and seen any of the working dogs? Mm -hmm. well, may I introduce my dog, who is now one of the therapy dogs working in the This is Tigger. This is Tigger. Tigger, take a bow. Not that way. And this is my very dear friend, Marway King. The therapy dogs at the airport are to help people deal with anxiety, travel, different things. <laughs> They're lovers. They're not. So where people may misunderstand something, sometimes you have to go back and look at it and say, why is this, or do I totally understand? And so for me, that was what Tigger, they're just their lovers. So we thought, it, for me, it was very important because the work I'm doing, I have the, the largest cancer prevention stabilization program. I've been working on it myself through donations. You'll see, I, I'll sign autographs for you afterwards. That is how I raise donations and awareness so that you understand I'm working on cancer in a different way. Food, food, food. It's human and animal. And depriving things with a body has so much sugar, yeast, this, there's genetics, but to try to deprive the cancer of having something to feed off of. That is very much a part of it, and, and hopefully you will you know, expand and, and, and learn as well. But this is the work we do. So we're helping people, we're helping the world, we're helping <coughs> our own, and hopefully it will help for those to understand, we can do better for the homeless people as well as the dogs and cats are just killing, being killed right and left in our, in our shelters. And that's why I do what I do. So, again, this is Tigger. Before they depart, do you have any questions you want to ask Marwick about therapy dogs or any of that? We help a lot of people that are in need of, of emotional support dogs. And it's very rewarding when you can help somebody to heal from a tragedy or a situation in their lives. If you want to come, when you come to the table afterwards, you can ask me. Marwick is training me. He goes, what is that that you say? Tigger. <laughs> he is so good at the airports. He could be a baby. They pull on his tail. They can pull on his ears. That is what therapy dogs are. They don't kill. They don't care. They're very well balanced. So here's a dog that was somebody else's throwaway. I'm tired. <laughs> And it's with somebody else's throwaway and is everyone else's treasure. Do you have any questions about <laughs> so, the, Yes, it started at LAX two years ago when he was one year old on his first birthday. He also works for the Burbank Airport. He works for the California Science Center as a therapy dog. He works for LA Public Housing with the Homes of Children. And he just got accepted into the LAPD pilot program for his work. <laughs> this dog that he threw away and he was saved not once but twice for people that wanted to put him down will now be on the witness stand with a small child testifying against an abuser. She'll so have Tigger. That's how important they are. Okay. And I take my bow.
or if any questions, oh, I will try to answer. Before you do that, we would like to present you with oh, a... Well, can I sit down? Yeah, of course you can sit down. <laughs> what do I get? <laughs> On behalf of the Fest, we'd like to present you with this check for the World Time Foundation. <laughs> questions about things, but it gave me a platform to hopefully help others in America, around the world. It gives you a voice. You'll see a lot of celebrities do use their voice, and other ones just show up at events. There's a difference. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to put it down. I'm just saying that there, there's a difference. If you care about something, you're passionate about it. Volunteering is so important. And I say to people a lot, if something's bothering you, if you're volunteering, I promise you, an angel will come and answer questions that you're like, where did that come from? Miracles can happen, and the rest of the time, life is like, we're climbing Mount Everest. Well, I know we're all tired. The world is very difficult right now. And we're all in it, but we can be kinder and better. Keep your eyes open, because there are challenges behind you. And it, I mean, it might just be that movie, that, that character. <laughs> but but they, come, they, they come when you least expect it. So stay safe. In the meantime, questions? We'll take some questions from the audience. Right there. Hi. Um, in, one of, in one of the final scenes, when the demon voice is completely taken over your character, and the two priests are having dialogue, and they're screaming at the demon, while you're laying in bed, are you just being quiet? Is there, the actors are playing off something, I'm guessing, because there's a lot of sound in the, in the final version, of course, with the demon screaming. Was there a recording that they're responding to? Were you making noise to them, or were they just doing dialogue in a silent room? Are you talking about when Max Lancito yes. and Jason are saying, I cast you out? Yes, yes. No, they're just doing, it's, it's intense. Um, so one of the things I was saying to you before was there's an honor system in our business um, where you need to have that privacy to work up to what is the character. You have to remember, this lasts for life on film. So if you're dedicated to it, the craft, that you have to bring the performance up. So Billy Friedman had had a lot of conversations with Jason Miller that it's, it's giving permission to do something to bring out a certain emotion. I'm very careful how I talk about things. Um, so uh, last night was a uh, walking, uh, 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 yeah, Joaquin Phoenix in his new movie, The, the Joker. And there was some, um, it was, they put on, they gave Jimmy Kimmel what really was private footage. I'm still in shock, and as was he, of him working through. So they're, they're working through stuff, working through stuff. I can do the whispering, I can't. You're taking away my concentration. I gotta, I gotta fire up and give you what you want. Cry, anger, I don't know, love, sex, whatever you may be doing. You, you gotta get in that space. So there were things that Billy did to get them motivated to get that, because you're doing it over and over and over. And then this angle, that angle, this one, whatever it may be, I will, you can come up to that performance. It's not once, and it's not a play. It's over and over. A lot of people don't like film and television because it's repetition. And um, I never had a need for an audience. I didn't know what it was. And even after doing theater and, and Broadway, that was my, my swan song. It was my farewell, and I said, Mom, we did it. And that was that. 
what I do now and the commitment to my life and work is where, where I'm at. But yes, there, there's, there's a give and take in there. So no, there's no soundtrack. That, all of that's done afterwards, post. Okay. Next question. The guy, you guys all have the answer? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, they? <laughs> God, I thought they took it like a comedy. Were you aware of that? How did you find it? I was the victim of it. It was horrible. They put out a lot of press that, to get people motivated and scared, they didn't need to. The movie stood on its own. But that's where all the, a lot of the rumors came from. I was the one that was taking the brunt of all of it. And all I could ever do is say to mom, why, you know, why is the press lying? Why is this happening? And she always said, I don't know. However, always tell the truth and you'll be fine. And that is what I'm known for. Hope that helps. There's a question. There was a gal. Yes? I don't know. Uh, I have a question regarding the scene where they actually insert the needle into your throat and they put the tape down and they tape your chin down. That was, they really did that to you? Is that true? <laughs> no. Oh, man. Uh, that would probably be illegal. That's called like Dick Smith and Marcel Volcatier being the geniuses that they were. You know, just like it, it didn't. It, 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 all of it is, is insane. I know it's quite something. I would pass it on, but I can't. They're not around anymore, but they hear you. Anybody else? No? Yes? Can't see. There's a question like that. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about um, parodying your iconic role in Reposent. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> because the exorcist is so intense, and really the world took it literally, I didn't have a way to get out of it. I didn't have a way to laugh. I didn't have, it was just, people are afraid of me, and you should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my friend Murray Langston, the unknown comic, who I think is one of the greatest gifts that was given to me in my life. Murray, uh, Murray was really helpful for me trying to bring some lightness, joy to my life because it was just so intense. Pretty much I was just running from people all the time because people didn't know how to communicate with me. Horses were my thing, you know, I finished school. But, um, so Murray Langston and Bob Logan, we made a movie called Up Your Alley, which I liked. It's a little movie. And Bob said, Kid, why, why he not spoof the movie so you could have a way of the, you laugh and and help people to know it's it is just a movie? And I said, no, no, don't hide it, don't don't bother, don't touch it. Well, he did, and he went to uh, Carolco, the film company, and they came to me and I went. And uh, they said, what would it take? Tom Hanks was on his way up, and, um, um, uh, help me out. Leslie Nielsen. Thank you, Leslie Nielsen. That was a senior moment. <laughs> um, so Leslie, and I knew Leslie from his daughter's Road Horses, and he was, um, we did a lot of uh, uh, um, tours and stuff, and kind of talk shows, things like that. Leslie's fun. But, um, so I said, uh, yeah, Tom Hanks for Leslie Nielsen. And they got Leslie in three days. And the best I could do was go, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> and I had to create that character. It was nothing. Um, I kind of went, okay, Jack Nicholson. 
you know, just kind of channel some crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then what would the demon be? You know, it's a comedy. So that's why everything's like that. <laughs> <laughs> It's fun, and I'm glad, and thank you for appreciating it. It means a lot. It really was to make people laugh and kind of realize it's not real. It's just there's points that should be taken to look at what life is about and your faith. And what was it that, um, so Max Foncito, Ellen Burstyn, in this version, brings him there by the fireplace, because that's not in the original movie. And she says, um, you know, coffee, would you like some brandy? And he says, uh, my doctors tell me that I shouldn't. However, what do you say? I am weak. And that is what the, the demon attacks. And that's, that's everywhere. Emotionally challenged people, people that are mean and evil, that you know they're manipulating you, you know there's something very wrong, yeah, there's something wrong. And it's really hard to go, <clears throat> but they're really talking about themselves in many, in many cases. So that's, there's a lot of that going on, that mental illness that we can help and do better. But we've closed all the institutions, we've closed so much. So anyway, those are important. Thanks. Anybody else? We have time for one last question. Well, all of a sudden, everybody wants to play. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got the best question? Okay, wow, well, there's 16 hands. Give me a second. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, you were famously nominated for an Oscar the same year as Tatum O'Neill, right? In 73. And you were both very young at the time. Her <laughs> Hello! They said be me! Uh, oh, for goodness sakes. Um, that's a funny question. Really fast. <laughs> no! The Academy Awards, you're nominated. You're going, like, wow! It's so overwhelming. And it is such a, an incredible uh, uh, experience. And, and they cannot take it from you, the nomination. There was a lot of questions about The Exorcist. I'll go to, into it with the autobiography, which I'm working on the last 25 years, but I'm, I'm gonna finish it now. <laughs> there wasn't an ending. I needed an ending. My ending is the Linda Blair World Heart Foundation and trying to make the world better. I would love to be making films again, but until everybody is, the animals are better, I, I just emotionally am not gonna stop. So, um, <laughs> so I got to run and detain them. Two years ago, I think, and oh God, no, we we're so good. We are so good. It's all good. And most people, most actors are not. They're not envious of each other. We're all working really hard and respect each other. Really fast. There was one over there, unless she just left, or he, or it. <laughs> okay. There was you, and then that's it. Hey, what's it going? Do you recall what was your reaction upon seeing the movie for the first time? Yes, I do. Why do you want to know? <laughs> um, the movie was released in December so they could make the Academy Awards. So I always joke and say, nice Christmas movie, right? <laughs> so um, we had done the film in New York. They flew me to California to do the um, all the loopy. Mm -hmm. Mom and I were out here and as we laughed. And I said, um, you know, we were like, oh, we'll never see California again. And um, go back home. They never had a premiere. But what they had was a, a, like a private screening, business screening in New York. So similar to this, it was um, kind of stadium seating. Um, and as the movie came up and as it played, and for me, who can have the only experience from what I went through, to understand what they were doing, 
and all of the different the angles from your master to your close up to the contact. You just seen it all put together. I never got involved with the dialogue. It was just later on that you start to realize what the movie is saying. At the end, I knew that my life had changed, but I didn't know how. And it was a standing ovation. And for a young person who has gone through that extraordinary experience, it's, it's emotional. And now I'm weeping, as I will do. And um, yeah, it was extraordinary. All right, my friend. A huge round of applause for you. Thank you. Thank you. the outside occupants signing merchandise. Thank you. I'm here. If anybody would like to make a donation to the charity, we have autographed, we have bright pictures, and not all ugly extras. <laughs> we make a little donation, say hello, snap a picture with me. And um, thank you so very much, and I'm glad you're here.